Okay, great. Okay, everybody. Um, today I'm going to give you an introduction to App Engine. Um, this is a story they may have, that may have two different endings, and I'm not sure which ending we're going to do today. So either we're going to do an example where I'll show you how to create an App Engine app, maybe I should plug in, or I will tell you about other uh, cloud, uh, other Google Cloud products besides App Engine. App Engine is only one Google Cloud product. So I'll let you guys tell me what you want to see towards the end. Okay, so I'm Wesley Chan. I'm a developer advocate at Google. Um, you can get the uh, um, the web page for App Engine is the little one right below. And then you can contact me on my Twitter, or you can also follow the App Engine uh, uh, team uh, Twitter. Okay, so uh, go to google.com slash app engine. I think it hasn't changed, so great. Um, yeah, okay, so about me, um, this is just a lot of uh, description that's not too important. Um, the most important thing about me, if you haven't already come to my talks earlier, is that I like to teach. So I teach at uh, companies, I give talks at conferences. Um, I write, so I have a few books that you may have seen before. Uh, the most important thing is I code. So I've worked at all these different companies before, um, working on Python full time as a software engineer for the last 14 years uh, using Python. And that wasn't actually easy to do, actually, to find a job as a primary software engineer where the main tool that you use is Python. That, that's been kind of tricky, even though, even though I was in Silicon Valley. So, Still uh, some work to do for Python to sort of catch up and become more mainstream. So the first thing I'm going to do is, before I talk about what App Engine is, I want to talk about uh, what cloud computing is, uh, uh, besides you know being buzzword compliant. Um, so um, once we go through the introduction, then I'll get to talking about where App Engine fits into the whole picture. And since this is uh, since Google is sponsoring the conference, I'll give you guys something. Google usually always gives out something. So if you go somewhere and you don't get something from Google, then there's a problem. <laughs> so I want you to be aware that there is there are uh, Google user groups all around the world. There is one in Firenze as well. So I actually want to give a talk uh, uh, there on Monday night. But wherever you are from, there is probably a Google Technology user group nearby. So I have one of those stickers so you can remember the, uh, the place that you can go and look them all up. So this is the GTUG, the Google Technology user group. Okay. You guys can grab one of these stickers. Okay. Just take one and pass it on. Take, take whatever you guys want. OK. Take one? Yeah, take one or whatever. We find whatever one you want. All right. So, what is cloud computing? Uh, basically, so here's like so a more official definition of cloud computing from the National Institute of Stand Standards and Technology that uh, they came up with about uh, a year ago, a little over a year ago. So that's a very formal definition, and uh, it's correct. Um, but uh, it, cloud computing has actually been around for even longer. Okay, so a long time ago, in 1984. Sun Microsystems had, you know, the company's slogan was, the network is the computer. Okay, so, you know, they had already been thinking, you know, as long as you have connection to the network, uh, we have the machines that do all the work. Um, now, the one thing that made it so it was not possible at the time was because uh, machines, uh, you know, do not reach the commodity pricing stage yet, right? Uh, Sun Microsystems machines, as well as SGI, HP, DEC, you know, um, they're all very expensive. So, so that's why, like, um, you know, cloud computing did not take off at that at that time. Okay, things were, you know, not as inexpensive as they are now. So, cloud computing sort of, you know, came into really strong focus um, in like 2004, 2005, uh, when Amazon came out with Amazon Web Services. Does everybody know EC2 and S3? Okay. And the main reason is because Amazon, over all this time in their entire uh, existence, has built up enough, you know, they have very large data centers, um, and they have many, many machines, lots of hardware, lots of disk, uh, in order for them to survive 
the day after American Thanksgiving, right? So you know that is like the biggest shopping day of the year. So they have all these machines so that you know they can take all these uh, the holiday uh, gift orders, right? What are all those machines doing in July? Not much. Taking up electricity. So they wanted to try to recover some of the money by subleasing their computing power to everybody. Okay? And that's why that's how sort of Amazon was sort of sort of really started the whole, you know, let's make it commercialized cloud computing. Okay. So and then large companies follow after that that have a lot of resources. Microsoft, Google, uh, Salesforce. Okay, so a lot of companies have uh, this bandwidth that, hey, you know what, I think we can turn computing into a utility, like your power and your water and your you know, electricity and your natural gas at home. So cloud computing is making computing a utility. Okay? Uh, and of course, there's, you know, people always talk about the benefits, like the cost, you know, you can, uh, you can grow and shrink as you need it, uh, things are automated. Um, so there's all, all these good things about cloud computing. Okay. So I don't have to go over this, it's more marketing stuff. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, the claim is by next year, one fifth of the largest 2,000 companies in the world will be using some sort of public cloud services. Whereas, you know, two years ago, it was only, it was less than 5%. So cloud computing is happening regardless of who cannot control it, it's going to happen. So um, I went to a very interesting talk given by the chairman of Symantec, John Thompson. And uh, he said that you just should not fight it. Okay. Now, it's probably not a good idea for you to you know, say, tomorrow we will switch everything to cloud computing. Probably not a good idea, because you cannot do it in one day. So he suggests that you, uh, as a company, you slowly start migrating to cloud computing because eventually everything's going to change anyway. Okay? Everything's going to cloud computing anyway. So you might as well start now. Let's start it uh, with you know, smaller systems that maybe are not as critical that you can sort of have a little bit of downtime or whatever, just to sort of transition over. So don't do everything all at one time. This is his suggestion. Okay. So uh, there's three different levels of cloud computing. Um, so I'll kind of describe to you what they are. Um, so at the first level we have, uh, the highest level we have SAAS, which stands for Software as a Service. And so in Software as a Service, uh, this means that whatever software you use, everything is online. You can only access this software from a web browser. There's nowhere else for you to get it. So an example of that would be you know, Gmail, Yahoo Mail, Salesforce, things like that. You have to have a web browser to use it. It's a piece of software that only exists on the internet. It does not exist on a PC or anything else. Okay? Um, so there's, these are examples of software as a service. Everything is in control of whoever the vendor is. At the very bottom is IAAS, which is infrastructure as a service. And that is where we have the familiar uh, Amazon, Amazon Web Services. Right, so you're renting machines, or you're renting, you know, you're renting disks. So what they give you is they give you the hardware, um, they give you electricity, uh, networking, and cooling. That's all you get. Everything else above that is your responsibility. Databases, uh, operating system, web server, load balancing, monitoring, reporting, and you know, all of those things you're responsible for. Whereas at the software as a service layer, you don't have to do anything except for log in. Okay? Now, the one that nobody really talks about as much, okay, so everybody knows about software as a service, because everybody has your Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo Mail, whatever. Um, and everybody knows about Amazon Web Services, because you're going to rent something, it's great. The thing that nobody talks about very much is platform as a service. But to me, I think it's the most powerful one of all, you know, regardless of, you know, the fact that, you know, I work or the app engine team, kind of ignore that, right? <laughs> uh, it's not a bias, it's actually true, okay? The reason is because platform as a service gives you everything that you don't get with infrastructure as a service that doesn't have anything to do with your application necessarily, right? I can write an application, but separate from that is, oh, what database should I use, can I use? What web server should I use, can I use? 
what operating system should I use, can I use? Okay, those things are taken care of automatically, whereas with infrastructure, I have to worry about that stuff too, in addition to my app. At the platform layer, the only thing I have to worry about is the app. Okay, and I upload it to whichever company is here, Microsoft, Salesforce, Google, doesn't really matter. I upload it and they run it for me on the same machines that run the rest of their company. Okay, and you guys probably know that Google has spent a lot of money buying machines and building up our data centers around the world to make our system scalable. I mean, it has to be, right? Because, you know, at Google, we think of scale as something that Google scale is the phrase we use inside the building because it, it has to be very big. How many people have gone to Google.com and have gotten 500 before? Right? Have you guys ever gotten an error on any Google search page? You may have once in a long, long while, but it should never happen because it's a company goal is to never have bad service, ever. So they have paid a lot of smart people to actually build this whole thing. So wouldn't you like your application to run on the same systems too? So that's really the value add for the platform. And you use platform as a service to write software as a service applications. Because once you write it, those applications now live in the cloud. And so they, in fact, so, so your users don't have to worry about anything else except for creating a login or having authentication or authorization to the data. Okay? So it gives you everything that infrastructure does not have in order for you to build SaaS applications. Okay, so that's why I think it's the most powerful because it sits right in between both worlds. Okay, so what is App Engine? Uh, App Engine is where you create your app, you upload it to Google, and then you can access it from any web browser or any mobile app, okay, depending on you know, where you are and what type of applications you have. Um, we give you a software development toolkit so that you can actually test it locally before uploading live. And once you do upload it live to, to Google and to the cloud, your app is instantly available around the world um, you know, for free, uh, mostly, um, except for China, where you might be blocked. Okay? That's not our, under our control, it's the government. So they choose to, to do that. And we use rotating blocks of IP addresses, so sometimes your app is blocked in China, sometimes it's not, depending on whether you get onto a bad IP, which, again, is also not under your control either. So it's very difficult for Chinese app developers, but they're uh, very persistent, and uh, they always try and find ways to get around the government because <coughs> that's what people will do. You guys will do the same thing if you're suppressed by your government too. Okay? Um, so anyway, so the main idea about having a good platform is that you don't have to worry about any of these things, well, except for maybe the cash part. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, we give you the machines, we we'll give you the database, um, you know, we give you the load balancers. Uh, of course, you have to come up with your own users. Um, you know, we have web server, we have the database server, um, logs, reporting, versioning, uh, monitoring, all those things. Google gives you for free because these things don't really, like, like I said earlier, don't have much to do with your app. They're what is called cross-cutting functionality. This is something you sit on top of your, your app is sit on top of but it's not exactly related to your app unless, you know, specifically, you know, your app is a web server or something like that, or a database server, okay? Um, so we try to tell people, you know, if you do it yourself, if you host it yourself, there's other costs, too. So, for example, I was telling you about Amazon. They have a lot of hardware that's not doing anything in the middle of the year. They just have machines to help them survive the big shopping days. Um, you have to worry, you know, if you have infrastructure as a service, you have to worry about upgrading that software. You got, you got Apache, well, you got to upgrade that sooner or later. You got uh, MySQL, you got to update that sooner or later. Uh, or maybe you want to switch away from MySQL to something like non-relational, like MongoDB or Cassandra or something like that. You have to do all that work, okay? Uh, maybe those databases have a license fee that you may have to pay. Uh, so there's a lot of maintenance, you have to wear a pager, you have to monitor your traffic to see whether or not, do I have enough capacity? You know, should I buy 20 servers or should I buy five servers? There's a big difference in cost. If you're a small company that doesn't have a lot of money, buying 20 servers may put you out of business. But it's also possible that if you don't have 20 machines, you also go out of business because you can't handle the load because somebody tweeted you or slashed out you. Right, so it's very hard to figure out how much you need 
In fact, that's one of the most expensive things that, uh, that, that App Engine and other platforms are trying to give you is scalability. To build that is very, very hard. Okay, we have a pretty good team of engineers, and even then it took them uh, several years to actually build App Engine before you guys even saw it. Okay? Uh, and of course, upgrading goes along with patches and stuff like that. Okay? So this is the marketing slide again, uh, a marketing slide. So Google says, well, we'll give you everything inside one box. So you don't have to worry about the rest of it. It's easy to start because we give you some free applications that you can use to try it out. We give you some free quota so that you can try it out. And if you think it's the right thing, then yes, um, that's fine. You can, you can, you can uh, use it for production. Um, and you know, only if you exceed the free quota do we actually charge you money. If you, if you have a website that doesn't get a lot of traffic, you may not pay much at all. Okay? So it's very economical and easy to get started that way. Uh, easy to scale means you don't have to do anything at all. Um, you don't even have to wear a pager or a beeper or anything like that to tell you something's wrong because you got a lot of traffic. There was one application developer who was telling me a story um, so uh, that um, you know, one day the famous actress Demi Moore found out about his app and she tweeted about it. And instantly, you know, 14 million people tried to access his, their app, but they didn't even know that until they checked their logs the next day. You know, their, their service never went down. They got a lot of traffic. You can see that on the graph, it just went up way high and then it went back down to normal after people said, oh, okay, this is pretty cool. So you never know when these things are going to happen, but they didn't even know about it, not much less worry about it, right? As a developer, that's one thing you do have to think about, okay? Uh, and then easy to maintain, so of course, you know, uh, App Engine doesn't do, you know, we're not a source code repository for your application, but we do save versions of your app for you. So, uh, you know, once you're ready to go live to production, you know, you have everything in your version control, like Git or Mercurial, you upload everything to App Engine, um, and then maybe, you know, a few months later, you have, you know, uh, version two. So you take that source code and you also upload that to App Engine. But then you discover, oh no, there's a really bad bug in this code. I really want to roll back. Okay. So you don't have to go uh, and back to your source code control system and go, oh, okay, you know, I have to pull out every single file that was V1. And I hope that my repository was correct. You know, I hope my test suites tell me it's correct. And then I'm going to re-upload it. And so you don't have to do that. Because App Engine automatically saves the, uh, the 10, uh, 10 version, up to 10 versions of your app. So you could say, with a click of a button, you could say, you know what, I don't want to run V2. I just want to. Uh, select V1 and then run that one, and you can do that from the control panel. Okay, but have to, you know, so of course it's a good idea to have version control, but that's really for catastrophic purposes. Okay, so we let you do that. So it's easy to maintain your application app engine too. Uh, so in other words, engineers at Google do all the dirty work for you, uh, and you don't have to work pagers because we have those for you. All right, so we get alerted when there's something wrong with the system. Okay, so anytime any of you guys have problems with your App Engine app, by the time you have your problem, somebody already knows about it at Google. Okay, because we have people around the clock watching the system. Actually, even better, we have machines that are watching the system. Humans are only contacted if necessary. Okay? So you don't have to be an IT person, basically. If you are a very small company, uh, we are your IT team. All right, so let's talk about the components. So you yeah, know what the system is. All right. So there's four major parts of App Engine. We have the language runtimes, which is what are the languages that you can use to write your applications with, you know, the libraries, the API. We have a web-based administration console for you. I'll show you what that looks like. We have the scalable infrastructure that I mentioned earlier. And then the software development kit for you to use to build your apps with. OK, so the thing that you have no control over is the scalable infrastructure. Okay. This is all under Google's control. Okay. Uh, you don't know where your machines are. You don't know what kind of machines they are. You don't know what kind of operating system it is, except that it's some sort of thing. Uh, it uses the Google file system, it's a proprietary file system. It's our custom <coughs> hardware. Uh, and we're running uh, using Big Table, which is uh, Google's non-relational data store. Our paper was written in 2006, so you can actually look up the technical details of how Big Table works. Okay. Very interesting. So that's the infrastructure. GFS? Uh, Google File System. We like to uh, homemade everything just because 
<laughs> we English is doing better than anybody else. Uh, we have a lot of smart people that are researchers or graduate students that have graduated and they want to bring their research to work, right? Working at Google is like working, is like, like, it's like a uh, postgraduate school. You probably heard that you know they give you food and they they wash your car, you can do your laundry there, there's exercise rooms and stuff. So it really is like being in that uni. That uni. Um, proprietary as well. So How does it most resemble? <laughs> I'm not sure actually. I have not gone down to all that. So, language runtimes. So we support three programming languages at this time that you can use to write applications with. Uh, three are Python, Java, and Go. And because we actually support Java, you have a bunch of alternative runtimes that I'll show you a little bit later. Um, but these languages were chosen because uh, they were considered batteries included. Uh, of course, Go is still very new. But Python and Java are certainly considered batteries included because they you know, pretty much include everything that you need to get started with now. Which version of Python? Uh, it uses Python 2.5. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's, a, it's a pretty popular release. You know, it's sort of old, so we're actually working on 2.7. So we're skipping over 2.6, actually. Um, there, uh, so when, when there is a strong enough market demand, they will put resources on it. So, um, if there's anything that you guys are passionate about, you you certainly welcome because the SDK, the client SDK, is open source. You're certainly uh, open to an issue tracker. You can go and submit for feature requests as well as bugs or anything like that. So, uh, you know, one of the most highly highly requested items is PHP. But we're sort of resisting that right now. But there is a lot of market demand, so there's, there's an internal battle right now about PHP. So um, there is an alternative, but the alternative is probably not what PHP programmers are really excited about. So, um, but I'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, so the three main languages for now are Python, Java, and Go. And the Go actually, the Go version just came out of Google I/O last month. So it's very, very new, but they already have you know, several hundred apps already. So, um, so yeah. <coughs> so we'll skip this slide. This is for people who are not familiar with what Python is. I just have this slide, uh, so that's not important. So you can skip that. So of course, uh, so Python was chosen uh, not just because uh, Guido works for the App Engine team. Okay, that's just a coincidence. Um, but Python was the very first runtime uh, for App Engine. And the reason why it was chosen was because you can develop very fast in it. Uh, maybe I should tell you all this because you already know, right? Uh, very low barrier of entry. You don't have to be a computer science major to use that bit. Uh, syntax is easy, robust. There's a, uh, a nice library of lots of packages and modules. So it was the very first API, and that came out in April of 2008. So it's three years old now. Um, Java was chosen because it's the theme of enterprise development. So whereas Python was the theme of user use. So uh, Java is everywhere in the enterprise. Um, so we wanted to make sure we really got that support in. Okay, it's, it's very closely to the Java service standard as much as possible. Again, there's also a rich library of packages and modules. Uh, and we also have a special uh, custom Eclipse plugin. So if you are an Eclipse user, uh, then we have special tools for that plugin that help you develop app engine apps and GWT group web toolkit apps too. Um, for alternative uh, IDEs, so if you're a Java programmer, you don't use Eclipse, and you probably use either NetBeans or IntelliJ, and there's also, uh, you know, uh, there's also App Engine uh, support for them too. It's just not from Google, the company. It's from the vendors that make those two IDEs. But this plugin for Eclipse is actually maintained by Google, and then you get alternative languages. Okay. Uh, so Go is new, like I said. It's sort of like a combination of Python and Java. It gives you the statically typed language that people want so much, but it has a simpler syntax kind of approaching Python, so it's like right in between. So it's got the complexity and power of a statically typed language, but 
and it's got the it's sort of the ease of use uh, of the dynamic attack language. So it's a, it's a flexible alternative so that if you've never played with Go before, you might want to give it a shot and try it. Habitation is a good place to try things. Okay. All right, so back to Java. So I mentioned earlier that we try to stick very close to the Java standard, so all of the JSRs. Uh, so if, you're, if you know how to write a servlet, create a servlet app, then you know, we have a web app container that's very similar to that. You know, there's a web.xml, there's also an app engine-web.xml. If you're familiar with using JDO and JPA, you can use those as well. Those are object relational managers. Uh, there's a lower level one called Objectify, uh, that if you don't like programming JDO and JPA, you want to go a little bit more low level and have it work a little bit faster. You can think about Objectify, or you can just say, forget about that. I just want to use the low level data store API, and you're welcome to do that as well. Um, there, you know, so there's URL, fetch, and email, all these things are fought, exactly follow the standards, and the same goes for your cache access. Okay, so we try to map everything as close as possible. So whatever you're familiar with, you don't have to learn something completely different. And also, it makes things more portable as well. Because if you're writing to a standard, then if you decide that App Engine is not the right thing for you, you know at least you, you know that you can run JDO and JPA outside of App Engine. Same goes for you know getting URLs uh, uh, and emailing and mempatch. You know you can get that elsewhere. Okay, so we try not to lock you in. Um, the plugin for Eclipse. Uh, let's see. It's very hard to see, but the most important things are. Uh, here's the Google Web Toolkit, and here's the Google App Engine uh, selector, so you can actually choose whether you want that additional support uh, active for your project or not. Uh, and, then, and then you get, uh, you know, you get your, your code manager, so you can uh, upload your app and things like that. Okay, and then, uh, it, it runs the development server and things like that. Uh, for Python users, we have uh, something, uh, something else which we'll see later. So I mentioned that Python, Java, and Go were the three main languages, but now that we have a JVM, we actually support other languages that are written on top of the JVM. So Scala, uh, Ruby, using JRuby or Ruby. Um, so here's the alternative to PHP. There's, so there's Quirkus, which is PHP running on top of the JVM. It's very, very, of course, it is like PHP, the language. The thing that's different is you can't just throw arbitrary SQL in there, which is what most PHP programmers do. You actually still have to write against JDO, JPA, or a, you know, the low-level data source. So that is what's very different that PHP users are not used to. So it's not like you suffer any kind of a serious performance penalty versus regular PHP. You know, JVM is very finely tuned. Um, it's just that you don't you, the experience of writing a PHP app is insane. Okay. Uh, you can also run uh, JavaScript uh, using Rhino, and of course you also can write Python uh, running on Python uh, on App Engine as well. And one of the more recent Jython books actually has an example of running Jython on App Engine. Uh, so some, a lot of beginners ask me, well, why would I want to write you know, Python and have it run by Jython when I could just write it in pure Python? Well, the main reason that for that, of course, is you know, your company could have spent many years building up a significant uh, set of Java packages and libraries. You don't want to lose all that, or you don't want to pour all that over, right? So if your new project is using Python, you can obviously use Python and you know, instantiate Python classes as well as Java classes and have those instances work with each other. So it's really a nice blue kind of solution where you have Java code and Python code together. Okay, so that's the main use case of Jython in this particular case. All right, so there's also a web-based administration console that you can go and visit for every app that you have. And we try to give you some data on your application. So one of the things uh, that people you know, say is the bad news or the downside of using a cloud computing system is that you lose control of your app to a certain degree. I don't have direct access to my logs. I don't have direct access to the reporting system that I really want to write for my tool to analyze the performance of my app and its users and how well it's, it's going. So uh, because of that, you know, Google is giving you this web-based administration console to kind of make up for that because you don't have it. We try to give you as much data about your app as possible that you may build. Okay? Uh, so, so in fact, you don't have to build it because we give it to you. So we show you how much traffic your web app is getting. So you can see for this particular, well, actually, this dashboard is about two years old. So uh, we have a lot more data now for your app than what you see here. But this gives you a basic idea of, of uh, what it has. Okay? So you have a traffic graph to show you, you know, from now and up to 30 days uh, what, um, you know, what your traffic pattern is like. So for this particular app, you can see they're not getting a lot of traffic. And then they're getting these periodic spikes once in a while. So this number is about 0.5. 0.5 requests per second about um, peaking. So that's uh, half, uh, 
half a request per second or one request every other second. So it's getting a little bit of traffic, right? Every other second, you know, some web browser is hitting your app, so you're getting a little bit of traffic. Um, it's also telling you about uh, your usage and your billing, so there's a little marker that shows you where your free quota is ending and whether you've exceeded that quota yet. It tells you what your overall quota is and how much you've used so far, what your budget is and how much it's costing you so far. Uh, you know, this is for CPU, for bandwidth, storage, email, things like that. There's a section for errors. You can't see it on this got cut off, but it shows you like, which URIs are giving you these errors and what is the percentage overall of all your errors. What is the current load that you're uh, experiencing? Uh, like this one is right now uh, 450. Uh, it tells you like what, what your, uh, how much CPU you're using. And then over here, you can see on the side, I can find out more about, uh, I can get more details about my quota. I can get uh, access to logs from my app. Um, I can take a look at my data store indices. I can uh, go and browse the data that I have in my data store. I can do settings. I can control who the developers are of my app. I can manage the versions. Um, I can control my billing settings, and then I can get the documentation, system status, and all these things that we give you this tool so that you don't have to build it yourself. Okay. Uh, and then we also have this overall system status. Okay, so uh, you know it's not always green like this. Sometimes there's problems, right? Um, you know, they're, you're, you're not immune. The cloud computing system is not immune to having issues. Um, but the thing is, a, a lot of times people people see, you know, people are experiencing problems with their app. But the, you know, when you go to the system status page, everything is green. So they're wondering, why is that? You know, is this thing lying to me? Well, the thing is, this thing is not for your app. This thing is for the entire system overall. So even if your app is maybe having you know, some problems, you know, not all apps are having problems. So it's only if it's a general problem or it's affecting you know, a lot more than just your app that things actually show up. And like I said earlier, by the time something actually shows up here, somebody already knows about it at Google. All right? So uh, you know, if you're running into any situations, then you know, just a, you know, file a ticket and somebody will look at it. All right? uh, we'll probably just tell you that somebody's already fixing it. All right? So anyway, let's talk about the SDK. So the SDK comes with a development server so that you can try locally before you actually upload it live to production. Very easy to deploy. All you need is your credentials. Okay. Uh, you need to use a UI or you use command lines. It doesn't really matter. You can, again, manage versions of the SDK and also you have access to the APIs. Um, all right. So I'll talk more about the, uh, the APIs momentarily. But for now, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, what type of users that we have, just so you can get an idea of who uses App Engine and what some of the numbers are. So App Engine actually has been growing very uh, steadily uh, since the original oops, since the original launch. Okay. So we've been around for three years now, and uh, usage is actually taking off significantly. To the point where uh, we made this announcement at Google I.O. last month, and that is that uh, Google has uh, put their uh, their name behind the product, and we are coming out of preview mode. So it will become an official product now. It will not be canceled, all right? Unlike other Google products, unfortunately, uh, it just happens from time to time. But App Engine has been decided that it will not be canceled. So it will come out of preview mode, and it will become an officially supported product. Okay. Which, which is good news. Um, the reason why, uh, the, you know, what kind of growth have we had? Uh, first of all, there's more than 100,000 active developers per month. Active means they're actually using it, they're uploading versions, they're, you know, they're using the product, they're developing on it, and, and things like that. Okay. So 100,000 uh, every month. There are more than 200,000 active apps every week. That means getting traffic. So you guys can all go back to your hotel room and do the hello world, and then it's just going to die. It's not getting traffic, right? So removing all of those apps that are getting traffic every day, there's more than 200,000. Actually, these numbers that I'm giving you are very conservative. The actual numbers are a lot higher, but we're not ready to make those numbers public yet. But these numbers we can make public, okay? So all you need to know is that it's more than whatever numbers I have here. Like Active apps, there's more than 100,000 active developers every month. There's more than 200,000 active apps every week. And if I was to take every single App Engine app and put it together, how many page views do we have a day? Okay. Anybody want to take a guess? How many page views every day? Okay. It's 1.5 billion page views every day that we see. Okay. That's pretty awesome. 
Yeah, it's uh, kind of shocking. Actually, so for a while we were under the radar, and as soon as we went over one billion page views a day, a senior VP found us. <laughs> and because if it's not a billion, then it's, it's not Google scale, people won't notice. But when it went over a billion, we got a visit from the senior VP who brought us some drinks and eats and sweets. Okay? So it's very, it's a, it's a pretty big number against all apps put together, and not individual ones. So who are some of our developers? Uh, so these are some well-known companies that use App Engine. Uh, of course, you know, eBay and the American shopping company Best Buy don't run their entire company off of App Engine, but they do run certain parts of their company off of App Engine. Same goes for another company that's not listed here, uh, Evite, if you ever used them before to host a party. They also, uh, they run at least 10% of their traffic uh, through App Engine, okay? Uh, but I'll talk about some of these companies, in particular these two over here, uh, Buddy, Coke, and Giga, because they're interesting scale cases uh, here that you should hear about. Uh, so Buddy, Coke is the first one. So I don't know if you guys use Facebook or not, but you know there's the concept of poking. Everybody know what poking is? Where you poke your friend, hey, hey, I'm here, kind of a thing. Uh, and then another company called Slide came up with uh, Super Poke. So instead of just poking somebody, you can like uh, throw sheep at them. Okay, or give them a beer, or give them a high five, or something. So that's more interesting. And then there's this third company called Buddy Poke. Okay, that has like little icons and you know uh, avatars, and you can dress them and uh, play with them every day to make them happy. <laughs> um, and they're on all the social networks like Facebook, MySpace, Orkut, High Five, Ning, uh, Hive, Friends. They're, they're on every social network, and you know they're making a lot of money. Okay. So we know that they're pretty successful. So what kind of scaling do, have they been able to do with App Engine? Um, I skip the slide. I'll something here. They have more than 62 million registered users. So that means there's at least 62 million rows in their database, or actually opt-ins. We don't use rows because it's, it's not a relational database, right? Uh, so 60, uh, more, actually, there are more than 64 million registered users now because I checked a few months ago. Okay. So that's a lot of users. Now, registered users is like having an app. Is that app active? So the more important number is how many of these users are actually coming and playing with their little friend every day, okay? On Facebook, uh, there are 3.6 million daily active users. Daily active means they come and check their app every day. On MySpace, there was 1.9 million daily active users. So altogether, at least 5.5 million people come and play with their little friend every day. Okay, and they're making money. And I'm not even counting the other social networks that they're on. Um, a question, Fox Hunter? Yes, they are. Because they launched really quickly right after App Engine came out. And the job of support did not start for one year. So we announced the job of support uh, at the one year anniversary. And then the Go announcement came on the three year anniversary. So yeah, so they are using Python. Uh, okay, so let's go back to a couple more apps. Uh, so. Uh, enterprise, oops, enterprise apps. Okay, so this web finance company is a very, very interesting company. So if you're familiar with uh, American uh, stock trading rules, you know that the America, uh, America has the SEC, or Securities and uh, Exchange Commission, that monitors you. So if you are a public company, very big company, you have to report all of your earnings numbers, right? And so doing all that paperwork, you fill out the S3 form, you have to you know, file your quarterly uh, earnings, your annual earnings, and all that paperwork, and it's very not technical. Okay, it's all like numbers and descriptions of how well your company is doing, what the products are, so it's a very boring thing. So what these guys have done is they've actually put all of this reporting system up into the cloud, so that all you do is you take your Excel or whatever, you just dump it into this thing, it, it formats everything for you, and they upload it directly to the SEC, all in the time. Okay, so they have very big customers. These are very big names because they're all public companies, right? So uh, they are an enterprise level company, and um, so this is an indication that you can use that engine for enterprise uh, scale apps. Another thing which happened recently, which you probably already saw that I've through multiple times, is the Royal Wedding website was based on App Engine. Now we all laugh and stuff because all the users are women, um, but uh, there's some men checking it out too, you know, okay? Uh, so on the day of the wedding, uh, they actually, their app 
had over 2,000 requests per second. Okay, so back on the earlier slide where I showed you the admin cost, remember how that app was getting like 0.5 requests per second? Okay, so this is 2,000 web browsers hitting this app every second. Okay, there were 15 million page views and 5.6 million visitors that day. Now this is just their blog. Their live streaming app had a much larger number, which I can't tell you uh, yet. Uh, we'll see if we can make that number public. But it is much larger than this number because everybody wanted to watch the event, right? And unfortunately, in America, it's like in the middle of the night, so some of them stay up like really, really, really late. Kind of like last night uh, to, walk, to watch it. <laughs> that was a that was uh, done by that's a YouTube app. I mean, it, it, it was done by YouTube, right? It was live streaming. Uh, but they use an admin app to kind of post the frame, so it's sort of all the static, uh, static content. So anyway, so it was a much larger number. Let's just say there were five digits here, okay? Five digits of requests per second. How many people are taking this app every second? Okay, now think about how you can build that into your app, okay? So that's one of the main reasons why you would want to go with a system like admin because the skin is one of the most expensive and difficult things to build. And maintain it. Okay. Um, is also used for gaming. Okay. Uh, so, for example, I don't know if you've seen that the Angry Birds game just came out with a web version for Chrome. So, that app is actually hosted uh, on App Engine as well. And a bunch of other uh, apps uh, uh, or web mobile apps. Um, so, let's talk about the other company I wanted to mention that's Geekia. What they do is instead of having an app that lives forever, they do apps for specific events, like a sporting event that only happens once in a while, okay? like the World Cup or something. Uh, or if uh, Hollywood wants to do some sort of special promotion just for their new movie or something like that. So these apps, they make it, it starts with no traffic, it gets a lot of traffic, and then it goes away and then do another one. So that's this type of scale. Okay? So we already saw on the previous page of the wedding, they got up to you know, 2,000. Uh, request per second, but here's an example of how that traffic came. So this app got at most 1,600 requests per second, but uh, I think this was like, uh, I think this was one of the, uh, either uh, it was an Oprah event or it was a, a President Obama town hall type of event. So nobody knows about it because they made the app. And then suddenly the news hears about it, so they talk about it on the television or on the radio. So then the traffic goes up to 400 and then 800, and say the 800 for a while, and then the event starts, and so the traffic boom goes all the way up to you know 1,400, and then it peaks at 1,600, and then the event ends right about here, and then you can see traffic going down. But these users didn't have to worry about that because I didn't handle it for them. So this is you know this this is measuring hours, so six hours, three hours. So in one hour, you know they got from zero up to 800 requests per second without having to do anything. <coughs> Okay, so that's uh, one another example of scaling. So the other thing I wanted to say is, your app does not have to be a web-based app, right? It can be in the back end for a mobile app. So you have the same issue. I'm writing an app for a mobile platform, but I have to host the back end somewhere. Do I do it myself, or do I go to the cloud to do it? Okay, the reason is because you might have to have some you know, back office processing. Um, you don't have to have some kind of web UI to talk to app engine. You can just have your web client. All you have to do to be able to talk your app engine app is to be able to make an HTTP post or get. Okay? Once you reach your app engine app, then you can do whatever you need to do, and then the user can see it reflected crap on their phone. Okay? So this is a good place, I think, for like putting high scores, uh, or medals, or badges, or you know, contact information. Things that, uh, you know, uh, what if somebody you know dropped their phone, or they broke it, or they lost it, or got stolen, right? Uh, and they want their high scores, which is very important to them, because they're challenging somebody, right? Uh, it would be a bad experience that everything's on the phone and it's gone. So it'd be great if you could like save it to the cloud somewhere so that if they get a new phone and they install your app, that they get their old data back again, right? So this is a good way to help your make your user experience much better. Okay, get the data off the phone as much as possible and put it in the cloud. Again, all you need is HTTP connection and you can talk your app engine out. Okay. So again, not everything is web based. So that's the most important thing I want to say on this slide. All right, so now I should actually talk about features of App Engine as well as what we're working on, okay? So, um, so like I mentioned before, uh, you know, we have a contained environment so that, uh, you know, again, you, you lose a little bit of control. You can't write your monitoring tool, you don't have the logs, okay, so I'm trying to give that to you. 
Now, you know that when you're running in the cloud, you're sharing all these resources with other apps. It would probably be a bad thing, and you probably would be very not happy if uh, some other apps got access to your app, source code, or data, right? You don't want that to happen because your stuff is private, right? So in order to make it so that your cloud neighbors play nicely with each other, we have a restricted environment. You're executing in a sandbox. You do not have full control. Okay. Um, so there are certain things that you cannot do. We don't allow you to like open a local file. We don't allow you to create a socket. Okay. We don't allow you to make system calls because those things could be potentially dangerous. All right. But why would you want to open a socket? I mean, really, if your app doesn't can't open a socket, it's pretty much useless system, right? You need to be able to communicate to the outside world. So instead of giving you sockets, uh, we'll give you, you know, the ability to go and make a call to a URL and get the results. We'll let you send or receive email. Okay, so your app can do that. Uh, sending email is pretty obvious, but sometimes people didn't know that you could receive email with your app as well. Same goes for IM or instant messaging or chat, XMTP. You can actually send instant messages from your app or receive instant messages. So you can write like a chat bot of some sort. Uh, we give you the ability to, uh, we have a memcache, okay, it's a distributed memcache. Uh, we have a data store for you. Um, if you have uh, jobs that take a long time, so the other restriction is you have to execute everything in your app when a user request comes in. That request must finish and you must respond back to the user in 30 seconds. Okay, because we can't have you taking all the resources away from other users, so there's a deadline of 30 seconds. If you're trying to do something and it takes longer than 30 seconds, you can spawn a task and have that run in the background, and you can have up to 10 minutes for that. And if that's not long enough, you want to just write a server and have it running on App Engine, then you can do that. We call that backends. I don't have the icon here for it yet. Um, but that's called backends. So you can actually have a server just sitting there running your App Engine app all the time. It's always up, it's always there. So there's no more deadlines if, you have to, if you're writing a service. Okay. So we introduced that pretty recently, so that's why it's not on the slides. Uh, we have user authentication, so you can uh, you know, require your users to have a Google account if you want. Or if you don't want to restrict your users to having a Google account, you can use OpenID. So OpenID is more flexible and global. And we're actually working on an improvement to OpenID to make it even more general. Um, so look for that coming up in the near future. We also have the Images API, so that if you want to like host a photo album there, uh, we have the API that lets you resize images, crop images, rotate images, you know, the normal things that you want to do with images. Okay? So for you photographers, you may want to host some of your portfolios there. And just automatically, you know, if you upload a massive wad to App Engine, we can do this resizing for you, we can make thumbnails for you. Uh, the SDK uses pills, so if you know how to use pills, the interface is kind of similar. Okay? Um, so yeah, so we give you these APIs because you don't have the ability to do some of that stuff. So I mentioned that you can't open little files, but if you do have a file API, you can create a distributed file. You just can't have, you know, a quick temporary slash temp file, you know, local file on the box. Because you don't know how many boxes your machine is running on. So, so we introduced the file API recently, so you can have a distributed file and share it amongst all the instances of your app that are running. Which I think is a better solution anyway. Okay. Uh, so, uh, in summary, we add features to App Engine all the time. This list is changing so often that every time I give this kind of a talk, I have to update this slide. I'm running out of room here. So I'm going to have to just consolidate to all of 2008, all of 2009, 2010, and 2011. Okay. Do you publish a book or a user manual that collects all the services together, or is it just not getting all the uh, We have the documentation. In the documentation, we have categories, and you can go to the categories and pull on the services section to tell you what the specific APIs are. But uh, there's no, uh, other than the docs, there's no uh, single place. Uh, there is also sort of a services page where you can say, you don't want to build an app that does, you know, like mobile stuff. So these are the APIs that you should be using or whatnot. So you have like a guide. Uh, but that has to be maintained as well. It's not as maintained as the regular doc stuff. Okay. Was there another question on this page? Yes. There's a trivial question. How do users access this service? Do I have to build a gateway page? Do I want my own URL? Or do you provide URL? Um, so the question was about URLs. Do I get my own URLs? So we give you one for free. It's an appspot.com domain. And you can use that if you want. But you can also see name that to something else that you own. And just redirect it. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, so for example, the most recent things that we just came out with were the Go launch, uh, announcements of leaving preview, we have full queues in addition to task queues now, so not only uh, can you create tasks and <coughs> app you just run them right away as quickly as possible, but uh, full queues are where you can make the, uh, the queue, you can actually create this task either from an app engine app or from externally by posting it. And as far as consuming those uh, the tasks in the, the pull queue, you can have your app in app pull out of uh, you know, pull the, the task out of the pull queue itself, or you can have an external app pull this. So you can manage different jobs where app engine is either the producer or the consumer or both or neither. Okay, um, so that's a, uh, that's another feature that we added. The back end feature, like I said, long term running service that was added in May. Uh, uh, so. Just yesterday, we released uh, App Engine 1.5.1. So this one, the main one, was 1.5. We announced that at Google I.O. But yesterday, we had a release of 1.5.1, which is uh, having geolocation headers now. So you can actually you know, kind of figure out where you are at or where your users are at. Uh, we support the WebP image format now. We have a proto-RPC, and not PRC, RPC. We also have HRD and SRK, SDK, which may not mean too much. I'll tell you a little bit more about HRD in a little while. Uh, and then channel presence. Uh, so a uh, channel is basically like, uh, you know, like, like Beacon or uh, um, it's, it's not WebSockets, it's, it's, it's more like Ajax. Okay. Um, so HRD, HRD is our, um, our reliable data store. We have two different data stores. Either uh, you, you choose one uh, when, you, oh, when you start your app. Uh, HRD is a more reliable one, so that's the default, and we recommend that one. The other one, uh, the other one is not as reliable. It might be slightly faster, but the performance is really about the same now. So we all recommend people using the high replication data store because it's more reliable. All right. So you may have heard, like over the last year, that uh, on you know certain periods of the year in 2010 or tw 2009, that App Engine's data store was not as reliable. So we wanted to address that because that was hurting a lot of customers. So that's where high replication data store came in at the beginning of this year. And so, and it's so popular and it works so well now that we recommend that because it's much, much, much more reliable. So that's not as much of an issue anymore. Um, so as far as what we're working on for the future, so one thing is, again, we mentioned we're coming out of preview mode, so it will become an official product, okay? Um, one thing that you cannot do with, uh, if you do choose to CNAME is that we don't have SSL access yet, so people have been asking for that, so just keep that in mind. Uh, we also want to have improved uh, import-export of data into the uh, data store. Uh, we're going to have full map reduce. Right now we just have the map, the mapper, uh, and we are working on finishing the shuffle part and the reduce part. Uh, but uh, you, can, you, can map o you can map over a large set of data now, so at least there's part of it. It just doesn't have the shuffle reduce yet. So uh, we gave a talk at Google I.O. On, on, on the current status of MapReduce. So if you want to find out more about that status, and you just go to google.com slash I.O. to go to, to see all the talks. Just click on the App Engine talks, and you'll see the MapReduce one. The other talk that we gave at I.O. is about full text search. Okay, so for some reason, people think that Google is a search company. Okay, and then why could I not do searches in my App Engine now? Okay. Uh, well, you know, the Google web crawler is, I mean, the Google search engine is made to grep the internet, not your data, okay? So we had to have a separate team build this thing from scratch. And not only can you do uh, searching text over your data store, but you can also do geo uh, searches. You can search for, uh, you know, date time things now. Uh, so that is also going to be launched very soon, and you can find out more about that by looking at that Google I.O. talk as well. That's very exciting, actually. Working on Python 2.7 support. Um, Right now, we're on 2.5 only. Uh, better monitoring and alerting system. And we want to raise some limits uh, that you know, people are asking for. But if you want to see the roadmap, the public roadmap, it's down here. So just go to the web page, and you can go look at what's currently on the roadmap. A question? <laughs> OK, that's a good comment. I don't know how many minutes ago that was, though. Three or four? Uh, this, this entire screen. Oh, this entire screen? Well, this entire screen is the App Engine roadmap. So <laughs> those of you who are watching the video, all I just did was went over these bullet points. You can do it on your own without me. In fact, just go to the, just go to the <laughs> web page, because that's probably going to have more up-to-date information, actually. Thank okay. you. <laughs>
So that's what we're working on. Uh, so we don't like to do vaporware, okay, where it doesn't exist. If you see something on the roadmap, that means there's at least one engineer actively working on it already. Okay, we will not pre-announce anything. I mean, you can think of this as already as a pre-announcement, but we're not going to pre-announce something that we're not working on. Okay, so we are actively working on these things right now. Um, I still miss something. Yes. How can I control that my data doesn't migrate to countries where I'm legally not allowed to have it stored? Okay, right now, uh, so the question is, how can I prevent my data from being migrated to countries where my data is not allowed to be in? Okay. So right now, App Engine, uh, all of the App Engine data centers uh, that, that are running Google data centers only in the U.S. right now. So all of the data centers that your App Engine app runs on runs out of Google data centers in America, not in the EU, not in Asia, not in Australia or New Zealand. All of the data centers are currently in the U.S. We are working on providing European and Asian support, um, but that is not ready at this time. So just so you know. All right, uh, let's talk a little bit about Google Apps. Now, some people get Google Apps confused with App Engine. They really don't have anything to do with each other. Google Apps is like Gmail, Google Calendar, Google Docs. All right, that's Apps, not App Engine. All right, so I want to make that clear. But you can write App Engine apps that run inside your apps domain. Okay, what does that mean? So when you, uh, you know, buy or use Google Apps, it's pretty much free for a few users. Um, you know, you get your, you know, you get, you get Gmail, Google Calendar, uh, and you know, Google Docs. And that all runs on Google's infrastructure and Google's data centers. But you can also add in your own custom app engine applications to this whole mix, and it'll show up in your apps domain control panel, just like all the other apps that you can control. All right, so, uh, so instead of using the, the AppSpot.com domain that we give you, you know you have a Google Apps domain, and so you can actually access your app using your Google Apps domain. So that's another way of doing it if you want your own <coughs> domain name. Uh, and the way you do it is you tell Apps uh, that hey, I have an App Engine app. I want to register that with Apps, and then in your control panel here, where you can control your emails, your Gmail settings, your Google Calendar settings, your Google Docs settings. Uh, your App Engine app will be put in here just as if it was something you bought from Google, except you wrote it. Okay, so to your users, you know, to your users, it'll just look like just a normal app that showed up on the system. So that's an interesting uh, way to use App Engine. App. Okay. All right. So that's the end of the main presentation that I have. Um, let me show you a little bit about getting started, and then we can kind of choose the ending of our story here, whether you guys want to start coding right now, if you have your laptops. If you want to start coding at then I can show you how to do that, or I can talk about other Google Cloud technologies too. So let me just at least show you what it looks like if you were to do this yourself in your own hotel room or during the break now, because we're going to have a nice long break. Okay. So there's only six URLs you have to memorize. Okay. So we start with the blog at the very bottom. So you should keep an eye on the blog. Uh, you know, uh, we update the blog every uh, every week or every other week. Uh, it's pretty active. Uh, to cope and create an App Engine app account, you go to appengine.google.com. So this is where you log into your apps and you manage your apps. You do have to have a phone that does text messaging using SMS, okay? Because we need to confirm that you are you. Uh, so that's where you do that. If you are a Java user and you want to get access to the Eclipse plugin, you go to code.google.com slash Eclipse. If you want to get to the, uh, the, you know, the, the SDK, the public, uh, the public uh, open source uh, clients, uh, where you have access to the wiki, the issue tracker, things like that, it's code.google.com slash p slash Google App Engine. Uh, the main homepage for App Engine, I already told you on the first slide, is code.google.com slash App Engine. That's where you can go and download the SDK. That's where the docs are. Uh, that's the main homepage. So uh, there is an online tutorial for you to get started. It's a Hello World tutorial like any other you know, uh, product. But if you get beyond Hello World and you want to do more than that, uh, some of us at uh, Google have created uh, additional code labs that go, you know, that give you more, that go up and beyond the Hello World tutorial. So you can access that at the bit.ly slash G code labs. You can actually get code labs for App Engine, for Android, for HTML5, Chrome, even for Wave, if you like Wave, okay? Um, so uh, 
so a bunch of us on the team have created these for users if you want to just try out uh, try out the different APIs. Okay. So when you get started with App Engine, you go to the web page and you download it. So again, here are the more important links. Uh, um, oh, I forgot to mention that at the main web page, you can also get access to the forums. You can also go to Stack Overflow because we have uh, Google engineers looking at Stack Overflow answering questions about App Engine there. Um, but if you do have a real serious question, um, I, I would suggest you check both Stack Overflow as well as the forums. They're both good places. Um, now, forums are also monitored by Google employees as well. So you would actually come to the forums if you have more specific problems like, you know, billing issues or quota problems or whatever. Those things people can't help you with on Stack Overflow. Okay? They can only help you with the technology and the API. Okay? So uh, what happens is when you download it, you can either choose to run app into the, the dev development server uh, off the command line, so you would actually do dev app server.py, or if you're using Windows or Mac, you can get a, a UI. Or if you're using Java, then you have Eclipse. Okay, so this is if you're doing Python, you're running on Mac and Windows, and you don't like to use a command line. Okay, then you can run the development server like this, just like you can type in the command line, or you can deploy your app live, upload it to App Engine by using App Config Update, and this is the deploy button. Okay, so whatever you're comfortable with, we let you do. You just have to provide your credentials again. Okay. All right, so when you create a brand new project uh, using one of these UIs, you get these three files for free. If you're not using, you know, if you're using just Linux where we don't have, uh, uh, you know, a UI, you have to kind of create these two, three files, two or three files from scratch yourself. But it's not that hard. The index.yaml is not necessary. Average will tell you when you, need a, when, when you need an index file. The two most important <coughs> ones are the config file, which is app.yaml and your main control of main.py, you can have other .py files as well. You can roll in your other, uh, any other Python project as well. So if, if you don't like our Django 1.2 support, you can actually take the Django 1.3 distribution and just drop that into your app, okay? Just make sure you filter out, uh, uh, filter out all of the internationalization stuff that you do not need because there's a maximum file limit of 3,000 files. It's 3,000 files, including static files, so be very careful. Uh, we support zip files, so if you want to throw all of your .py files into a zip file so you can't get around the 3,000 file limitation, you can do that too. Okay, but you know, for example, if you guys are Django developers, you know that certain things you can't put in a zip file because you need to use them, like manage.py. Okay, so that you have to have out. But other, other library stuff you can have in a zip file to kind of get around this limitation until we can get this changed or lifted somehow. Okay. All right, so when you uh, edit the app.yaml, you can see that the configuration is you have to give your uh, application name followed by the version, which could be any string. Uh, you're using the Python runtime. Right now, we're using API version 1, so when Python 2.7 support comes out, that'll probably be API version 2, all right? Uh, and then down here, you uh, specify all of your handlers. So you give regular expressions to all the URLs, and whatever URLs match the pattern, they get handled by, this, by the handler that you specify. So you can have more than one. But this is this just says main.py is going to handle every URL. Okay, uh, do we have a question? Yeah, it's a, it's probably a very silly question, but mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier on that as long as you were post or getting, um, I'm assuming it handled. You know, you've not put some limitation on the other verbs in it. You <coughs> can of delete and add and so yeah, those should. So yeah, if you put a rest. Yes, that's yes, yes, okay. right. That's mm -hmm. all I was. Yeah, right, silly right. question. Yeah, no, but that's a question that people ask all the time anyway. So yes, can you develop a rest of the service on that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, next one. You have, uh -huh. So this and uh, you show that using uh, Python and Linux makes you using uh, formal line. Mm -hmm. or, or the UI. Uh -huh. or, uh, oh yeah, not in, that's right, not in Linux. That's right. You told also we can use the Gips. So I can get Eclipse out of Python, so I have Eclipse for Python. Oh yeah, on, on, on Linux, yes, but if you have Pydev, I don't think Pydev has, the Pydev plugin doesn't have the same stuff as the Eclipse, the Google Eclipse plugin. So that's a thing. Yeah, you can use Eclipse to do your Python development, but it doesn't have the, the UI features. So, uh, question? Uh, what can you? Or what are we using to build the sandbox? It's 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 custom made, so we restrict uh, the things that you can do. For example, for uh, Java, uh, you can only use the whitelisted uh, class list. For Python, you don't have access to all of the modules. 
And so there's a web page uh, that you can email me later or you can just Google for it. There's a web page that says what modules you can't use with App Engine. Basically, you can't upload anything with C code in it. It has to be pure Python, okay? And things like C pickle don't exist because if you import C pickle, it's really just going to import pickle, all right? Uh, you don't, you can't, you know, you can't use, you know, you know obviously OS.system is not going to work, okay? So a lot of things just don't exist. Either you'll get an exception or it's empty, okay? There's a list for that. No, no, it's it's just it's just whitelisting and some custom custom sandboxing. All right, so when you do create your sample app, it makes a hello world for you. This is what the app sort of looks like um, when you get it. This is sort of my optimized version of what you get automatically. I'm actually trying to change the uh, the UI so that it automatically makes Python code that looks like this. It's not as formatted as nicely as this. Um, so uh, I just it's just lower on my priority list right now. But um, anyway, so you can see that uh, for your handlers, uh, you list out all your URLs that you're handling. So the the regular regular expression redirects everything here, and from here you can kind of spawn off different handler classes. All right. So it's a uh, we support Whiskey. All right. So uh, you're creating a Whiskey app and defining all your handlers and whatever handler you get based on the URL. You come up here and you can either write a get and or a post method. All right to handle those requests. And then you just do whatever you need to do, um, and then you can run it and, and go from here. Okay, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, web app is just one example. This is the web, web the, the lightweight web framework that we provide for free. But you can also use Django if you want. Um, and you can uh, there's also external frameworks that you can use like Tipfy, T I P F Y. That's another very popular lightweight framework. Uh, it's a the work suit style like Flask actually. Um, and someone else is also working on Web App 2, which is external as well. So I think the most important thing is, is, is that you know, if you just want to try it, then you can use Web App. But if you want to use something more serious, you can. So we support uh, Django 0 0.96 all the way to 1.2. Uh, if you want 1.3, like I said, you can kind of just install that yourself with the rest of your app. Uh, the one tricky thing about using Django is that if you really want to write a Django app and run it on App Engine, you also have to go and download Django app, uh, Django not rel, and Django app engine, right? Does everybody know about that? Okay, because Django only runs on relational databases right now, um, so to make it run on top of App Engine's non-relational database, you need this non-rel layer. So non-rel has you know backends for um, for App Engine, for MongoDB, and for uh, they're working on like Cassandra, SimpleDB. Um, things like that. So they're tr trying to provide a generic layer to help make Django run on non-relational databases. So you can look them up. So once you're done with your app, I can go and you know again click on Run on the GUI, or I can just say dev app server .py and in the directory that my app is in, where the three files are, you know app.yaml and main.py. Again, index is optional. So once you do that, you tell the directory name. It starts your server. Again, you can also use a launcher. And when you go to a web browser, you go to whatever port that you started it on. Gen generically, if you don't specify the port, it's like 8080 or 8000. And you can see your hello world. So that's exactly the same code that we had here that uh, you can see on your local machine. And once you're ready to go live, you know, you go to appengine.google.com, you register, you, use your, you get your SMS that has your secret uh, in it, and then you, know, you register your app. You tell it what kind of data store you want to use, uh, what kind of authentication you want to use, Google accounts or OpenID or whatever. Uh, and then everything's good. So once your app exists, oh, you, one thing you do have to remember is you have to, since you get a unique app ID .appspot.com, you have to pick a name that hasn't been chosen already. Okay, so you have to be very creative there. All right, <laughs> and, and and if you, it's a one-time thing. Once that name is taken, nobody can ever get it again. So if you care about that URL, don't delete it. Okay, if you delete your app, it's not like it's going to come back into the system. It's gone forever. Okay, so keep that in mind. Anyway, so this is what your con your control panel will look like. It'll tell you like what your app names are and what your what version it is. So uh, currently, right now, because we're still in preview mode, you can get up to ten applications for free. But once we go official, we go live, and you know becomes an official product, you're only going to get three applications. Okay, so sign up now. <laughs> and it won't be until like towards the end of the year anyway, so you don't have to panic like you have to sign up like at this minute. Okay, we're not going to change it to three. Um, but um, yeah, again, the whole idea is try before you buy. Really. 
Uh, also, so the other thing is when you get your, when you have your app.yaml, of course it generates a generic name, like hello world, obviously that one's taken already, so you actually need to change that if you really want to upload it live. If you're just running the development server, the SDK, it doesn't matter what that is, right, because no one else is going to be using it. But if you're uploading live, it has to be this name.appspot.com, it's your actual app ID name. Alright, so just be aware of that. And when you're ready to go, you can just do um, app configure py update again the directory where your uh, files are. So this is app engine. Actually, I shouldn't have done this. I should have just cd to desktop slash Google App Engine, not hello world, because otherwise I have to do app config update dot right. It's the directory name. Okay. If I cd into it, unless I have a subdirectory called the same name, we should do that. Then it asks you for your credentials, like your your email pass, the email and password. And then you just go to your app ID.appspot.com and your app is again live to the world, except for maybe China. <laughs> okay? So that's how that works. All right, so that's, uh, that's the end of the talk. Um, thanks for coming. And um, I can, again, we have a few minutes left. So I'll take QA now, but afterwards I can either show you kind of how to do App Engine Live on the screen. Or I can tell you about other Google Cloud products if you're interested. So let's ask the Q&A first. And then if you're not asking Q&A, you can also say other cloud or app engine. OK? <coughs> so all right. Anybody with questions? I guess you asked all your questions already? Oh, OK. Raymond. OK. So you had mentioned this uh, a case where Google developers didn't even know they were being hit with an enormous load because they didn't work with their account. That's right. Have they preset some limit that said, I will pay for up to this amount, or how does the billing, they didn't get paid, so they didn't know that they went to the, did they pre-authorize, I'll take up to a million hits and I'll pay for that, or does the billing come later? And then, given that if someone does a, a denial of service attack or stroke your uh, account, does that uh, knock you offline? Is there, I presume there's protections against those things. Okay, uh, good questions. All right, I'll take the first one first, which is do you pre-allocate, do you pay for stuff? So uh, yeah, so basically uh, when you turn on billing right now, uh, so we give you a free quota, that's great, right? But if you trust Google enough to give us your credit card number, we'll give you even more free quota, okay? And only if you exceed that additional quota do you actually get charged, all right? So what happens is, uh, so Google scales, and uh, you know, up to a point where you, you, know, you reach your, your maximum. And so what is the maximum you set your billing? So you do, you, you do set a budget uh, if you want more services, but uh, the, the current default is you get like one gigabyte of incoming bandwidth a day, as well as one gigabyte of outbound data. Uh, so if you think you're going to exceed that, then you really should set your budget accordingly. So uh, my suggestion is over allocate your budget, put in a really large number. The reason why is because um, and I've had people do this, which is not a good idea. So you allocate certain amount because you know they don't have a lot of money. They're afraid that Google is going to charge them so much money they're going to put them on business. All right, um, that they they had a very low budget, and when their traffic got to a point where they're hitting their limit, and they asked us to, oh, we need to up our budget. We need to up our budget. The problem with that is it takes a while for that to happen. Okay, the reason is because this is a recurring charge. And those are different from, like, you go to the store, the market, and buy something and charge a credit card. It's very different when it's repeating. You have to go through more security. It takes longer. So when you do it, when you uh, set up billing through uh, App Engine, it has to go through checkout. And then Google Checkout has to talk to your credit card company. It has to authorize that recurring amount. Uh, and so it doesn't happen instantaneously. It ha it, sometimes it takes more than eight hours, OK? Because the credit card company is backlogged with these type of requests. So if you're in a panic situation, it's too late. Okay. So it's better to over allocate your budget, and then if you don't, if you know that you're at, oh, I'm never going to use this much budget, then you can roll it down. Okay. Because bringing your budget down does not require you to have to pre-authorize again with your credit card company. So it's faster to bring the budget down than it is to make it go up when you're in a bad situation. Okay. So that's one recommendation that I have. Um, and then second question that Raymond had was about denial of service attacks. So we do have a DOS API, so and we actually tell you traffic. So one of the things you did not see on the uh, on the control panel that was because of the DOS API stuff got added later. There's actually a blacklist link at the end. You can actually see from which IP addresses have given you the most traffic in the last in the current day. And so if you think they're a Russian spammer or whatever, you can actually filter out individual IP addresses. You can filter out subnets. You know you can control all of that stuff. 
Uh, of course, it's more difficult if it's a D if it's a DDoS. Um, so you know that's that that we kind of rely on Google the company to take care of uh, because we also can tell we already have a, you know monitoring that takes care of that kind of stuff. So that's sort of beyond the app engine now. But yes, we do have a denial of service uh, support. Okay. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. I still have legal concerns. You mm -hmm. just uh, gave a few examples of fatal error in my country. So, for example, I'm usually not allowed to log IP addresses when I disable that. Uh, let's see. You're not doing the logging. Google is doing the logging. Yeah, Does that count? But I would have to take a note from my customers mm -hmm. that the IP address is logged. I see. Um, I don't believe that there is a way to turn that off, but I might be wrong. So it's best to drop me an email and ask me, and then I'll ask the team. So the next question is similar. Can I um, get an invoice which uh, shows the amount of money in euro and how my local taxes are visiting in this invoice? Uh, so right now, so Google Checkout will show you what you're going to be paying, including VAT, if you don't have a VAT ID. Um, but we don't do invoicing yet. The invoicing part will actually come when we leave preview mode because some people want different forms of billing outside of Google Checkout. Ah, oh, but you have well. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <laughs> I hope so. It's supposed to be a real product, right? <laughs> yeah, so. Question? So, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Did you mention the fact that now you, uh, with the recent release, uh, are you, uh, you can do uh, geographic search uh, and date search and more kind of searches. Uh, that's full text search, uh huh? And also geographic. Yes, uh, that is, that's right. Uh, I can put uh, points uh, into the the data store and say I just want it to this region. Uh, yeah, the best thing to do is to watch the talk at Google I/O that was given last month. They give you, they'll answer your questions. Okay. Okay. But right now the product isn't out yet, so I can't really say anything other than. And is it with the last release, one point five, or it's one? Uh, we announced it at the same time we released one point five, but it is not in any release. It's not a release product. Ah, okay. It's okay. Coming. Yes, it's coming. So watch the video. Thank you. Yeah. Huh? Just like a question, but is there an ETA on that? This all sounds really interesting, but. Yeah, we can't give dates. Yeah. Okay, we can't yeah, make promises. Yeah, we can't give promises we can't keep. Yeah. But we, at least you'll know that we're working on it. And they actually may have. They may give some sort of estimate in the video, okay. Okay. which I actually need to watch myself. Yeah, actually, <laughs> uh, in the back. So you mentioned if you're building a Django app, can you can't use the native native database like Postgres. That's right. The non rel uh -huh. uh, If you later decide that you want to move off of Google App Engine and, and you know, roll your own server infrastructure, what yeah. Is and I also heard that maybe Google's going to offer relational databases. Okay, yeah. So that's about. Uh, so the first question is about well, what if I want to you know if I decide that my Django app I'd rather run it myself on my own stack instead of App Engine. Perfectly fine. So in, in, in with that, I suggest you use Django non rel and just you're writing against the Django ORM. Anyway, so it doesn't matter to you what's underneath. Uh, but when you write against J uh, uh, Django non rel and Django App Engine, uh, then you can just take your app, lift it up, and drop it somewhere else, and just change the settings up you want. So there's no vendor lock in or anything like that. You are not restricted to having to use Google's uh, data store API. Uh, in fact, the Django non rel Django uh, App Engine um, uh, shim, basically, that just makes Django's ORM talk to App Engine's data store. So you don't have to do that. Uh, second question is Cloud SQL. So uh, last year at Google I.O. we announced uh, a Cloud SQL support. Uh, right now that's still in the trusted tester phase. So we're actually having you know large companies that require relational databases, you know, test out the system, help us debug it, make the product ready for, uh, for production and for, for going live. But uh, it's not ready for that yet, but we are working on it. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. To your database uh, APIs support Unicode, what about storing uh, blobs? Can they have Unicode names? Uh, I believe so, yes. Everything is Unicode? Uh, it should be. Even usernames? What do you call the users to give names? Are they I Unicode? still think it should. I, I, I don't know 100% for sure, but uh, if you drop me an email, I'll find out for you. But I, I pretty much think they are. <laughs> so okay, no, it's okay. Anything else? Do you guys want to hear other cloud, or do you guys want to do live stuff? Oh, yeah. So I'm actually giving talks at uh, other conferences. So if you happen to be in the area, just uh, come by and say hi. I'd like to, uh, like to meet users. 
So I'm going to be at this uh, ACM conference in New York uh, in two weeks. And then I'm going to OSCON. I don't know if anybody else is going to the open source convention in Portland in uh, four weeks. And then I'm also giving a Python uh, public course that anybody can sign up for and take it if you want a, a, an excuse to visit San Francisco. All right, just come by. I'm very happy. But I think you guys already know Python. But I'll have an advanced. So that's in October. I'm actually doing an advanced class in February. So, uh, but I have to talk about other Google Cloud stuff like Google Storage if you want, or I can talk about the uh, prediction API. What do you guys want to do? App Engine or other Google Cloud stuff? Because I have to talk about App Engine. Cloud stuff? Yeah. Okay. I think we can do the tutorials and things in our own time. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, that's great. So last year, last Google I.O. in 2010, we announced three other cloud products, Google Storage, Google Prediction, and then Google BigQuery. Uh, so I'll go over Storage and Prediction, but uh, since I already talked about App Engine, that's off the list. Um, actually, I need to get the Prediction logo, and these guys are still working on their logo, so it'll be interesting to see what, what their icons look like. Uh, BigQuery is not ready to be live yet, but I'll tell you what this is. Uh, BigQuery is where you want to issue a SQL uh, uh, select call across uh, you know, five terabytes of data. Can't quite do that with MySQL today, I don't think, right? And you need to be able to have the answer come back quickly. Okay, so that's what BigQuery is. You upload a massive amount of data to Google, and then you can run SQL queries on it. So that's what BigQuery is. And you can, it's still in preview mode, and you can go to the website, Google for it, and you find out uh, uh, how to use it. Okay? But I can tell you about storage and prediction. So because we announced it, uh, the preview last year at Google I.O., this Google I.O. last month, these products went live. You don't have to be opted in anymore. It's not whitelisted anymore. Anybody can sign up for a Google storage account or prediction. So Google storage is like uh, Amazon S3, rent to disk, basically. Okay. Uh, so it's cloud-based, binary object store. You can have lots of buckets and many, many objects in those buckets. You control your, your data. Uh, um, you know, you, you, have, you, have, you have ACLs, so you can say who gets access to it or not. There's a RESTful API, stuff like that. So, um, you know, and all these other marketing things. But the more, more important thing that you need to know is comparing Amazon S3 versus Google Storage, okay? So Google Storage has lower latency, and it's also more reliable for large downloads. Like if you're downloading like a gigabyte, chances are it's not gonna get disconnected, so you have to try and redo it again. Uh, so because it's faster and more reliable, we charge a little bit more than Amazon. So those are probably the most important things you need to know. Uh, and we already have a lot of users using it. Um, this is just a, a list of people who were using it before we went live. Uh, and these are uh, external users. So we have internal users, external users. All right, so since I'm running out of time, I'll just go over prediction really fast. So the Google Prediction API is probably going to be Google's most interesting API, period, because this is machine learning in the cloud, okay? So this is where uh, you can do a call like this. I can pass in some, some phrase. I can call the prediction API and it kind of tell you what it is. So it's like a crystal ball. You just have to train it. Okay, so if you know machine learning, it does super, uh, if you know machine learning, it, it uses supervised learning, so you have to do training. You upload all your data and the training, and then you can do predictions. For example, you upload these sentences, and you say, oh, this is English, this is Spanish. The next time you upload a sentence, it will actually be able to tell you which one they are based on the clues that it's gotten, based on some keywords that it recognizes. Okay? So this can be used for lots of different things, like spam content. Like if you have a blog and you want to see whether or not, think whether it's a spam or not, and you can block it. Uh, or you can check, you know, for voting, you know, in which way are they leaning, one political party versus another party, or, uh, you know, bad content for children, or like how do people feel about your product? Like is it, is it are they happy with your product? Are they ha mad with your product? Okay, so you can do lots of different things with the Prediction API. It's RESTful, okay? So you basically just upload your data, you train your data, and then you can make predictions. These are all REST calls, okay? Um, and that's pretty much it. So any other questions? Okay, yeah, we only have time for like two more, that's it. Yeah, so. okay, so um, do you reuse the data from, because I'm talking about the uh, connection is what you're going to be training. Mm -hmm. uh, does, is your training, uh, the results of your training, what you do in your training, uh, isolated to just you as a user, or is it spread out and then all users or does Google reuse it in any way, shape, or form? Uh, Google doesn't reuse your okay. stuff. Okay, you control your model whether you want to start from scratch every time you do training or whether you want to reuse an existing one. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can read, uh, it's live now, so the documentation is pretty fully okay. featured. Okay. Last question. My company has hundreds of petabytes of 
Oh, Google Storage? Oh, you have a bunch of terabytes uh, of, of data on S3. Oh, we provide this really cool tool called GSUtil. Okay, so it uses Boto, if you're familiar with Boto, because that's a library that talks Amazon, but we've customized it to talk Google Storage. You have to do something like uh, GSUtil cp-pr s3 colon slash slash the name of your bucket and then gs colon slash slash your google bucket so you can actually start massive copy jobs that way uh, for, for speed uh, for latency and for reliability if you need it if you want cheaper storage you know if you want to just buy like a fiat then you can just stick with amazon s3 but if you want a mercedes then you can go with google storage that's, That's marketed market in Europe also? Uh, uh, both, both the US, US and, and Europe. Europe. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Thank All right. you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.